Okay. Well, welcome to the uh, first webinar in our series on startup law. Um, these webinars are produced by the tax section and business law section of the Beverly Hills Bar. Uh, our partner in this uh, venture, it's, an, it's actually a startup in itself, is Cross Campus. It's a co-working um, uh, firm with the locations throughout uh, Southern California. Uh, I'm Bill Norman, and with the uh, law firm of uh, Norman and Zach, um, co-director of the initiative, uh, we're volunteers. My other co-director is Laban Larson. Uh, she will not join us today, but in, in subsequent uh, um, webinar, she will. Um, these webinars were produced with the uh, major assistance of the um, advisory board, three of whom uh, you'll meet today. Uh, there are presenters in the, in, the, in the program and others as we progress. Uh, these are designed especially for uh, uh, founders and managers and board members and advisors to uh, um, start up enterprises, uh, not necessarily for uh, you know, practicing lawyers, although we have those on, on, the, on the, as attendees. Uh, you'll be able to ask questions to the Q&A function. Uh, Larry Johnson, who's our moderator, uh, will uh, be able to uh, pull the questions up. Um, the, um, uh, we asked that the, um, uh, that the people who are auditing, that is Beverly Hills members who are not connected with entre entrepreneurial activities, hold their questions until at least five o'clock. They give our, uh, our uh, startup people, uh, which is you know, the major uh, thrust of this program, a chance to ask questions. Um, some of the questions may have to be deferred. This is the kind of introduction and overview. Uh, so the speakers will either give it a try um, or they'll, re they'll uh, defer to, uh, to somebody that, in a subsequent webinar that may have you know, more expertise in a particular area. Uh, so don't be disappointed. We'll get to the questions eventually. Um, we will... Um, um, Remember that the uh, that, that our purpose here is to uh, assist uh, startup companies and, and their advisors uh, with determining you know when they should use legal advice, what kind of legal advice they should ask for, uh, and also to evaluate the advice they're getting and be able to implement it all in a cost-effective way, because very often and, and almost universally, startups are are challenged and in their, in their resources available. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the way, if, if you go through our, our four web webinars here and the webinars we'll have in the fall uh, to make your uh, uh, in engagement with, with attorneys and lawyers more cost-effective and uh, more practical for your business. So uh, let me then, introduce our, our speakers. Um, we have Tom Gaffney, um, who's a, a startup lawyer. He's with Olson and Brueggemann. Um, and he's got extensive experience. The bios, by the way, are at the end of the materials. Uh, we have Stephanie Granada, uh, who's very experienced in advising entrepreneurial um, activities. Uh, she has her own firm, Granado Law Office, and she's on the advisory board of the Women's Entrepreneurial Entrepreneurs Global Inc., uh, which is a very high-powered uh, group that supports entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs uh, throughout the world. And our moderator is going to be Larry Johnson, He's the founder and CEO of LR Johnson Associates LLC, which provider of specialty food products. He also does teaching at um, El Camino College to, and with respect to poor, small businesses and has an expensive uh, background in advising uh, small businesses and entrepreneurial activities. So with that, let me turn the program over to uh, uh, Lawrence Johnson and let the games begin. Thank you, Bill, and welcome everyone. We're excited to uh, have you at, uh, at this uh, uh, webinar with us, and uh, we hope that uh, you'll find it informative. And uh, as uh, Bill mentioned, please put your questions in the Q&A, and uh, if appropriate, we'll answer them during the session. 
but definitely uh, at the end. But uh, don't hold back. Just put your questions in at any time. So we'll get started with what I think is probably one of the important uh, tools that any entrepreneur can put uh, his or her hands on, and that is the business plan. And uh, there are many reasons to have a business plan. Uh, as a tool for the entrepreneur, it is, it is critical uh, as a way of judging where you are and where you're going and keeping track of that. But uh, let me open it up to uh, our panelists, Stephanie and Thomas. Uh, how do you view the plan and, and what do you think are some of the other important roles for the business plan? For me, I would say, hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, the business plan, in my experience, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs. Many of them start with a one-line concept. But to move forward, it's important to map out a plan. Once you launch, uh, you could be racing ahead very, very quickly. So for me, when I look at entrepreneurs, the thought process that goes into a plan is really the important part. And of course, you're going to pivot as an entrepreneur. So you're going to put down a plan and then you're going to be revising, but you need a baseline, something in writing so that you can measure your progress and measure your pivots. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I can kind of echo on that too. I think I think having a business plan, a lot of people don't know where to start and they think it's going to be set in stone, right? A business plan uh, can be anything that you really need it to be at the beginning, right? Uh, but you just have to have some kind of concept and idea of what you're trying to do, right? So if you actually sit down and really conceptualize uh, your plan for your business, you should put it on paper, right? It's a, it, can, it can be this living and evolving document to begin with. All right, but uh, eventually you're going to mold it and craft it and kind of work with it. If you need to pivot, you got to pivot. And something that in, is important to come from, because um, if you're trying to, say, get investors on board or something, you're going to want to have some form of document to show them exactly what you're going to be doing. And usually that document is uh, in the form of a pitch deck, like a, a pitch slide, because they're just going to want the highlight bullet points and then they'll want a more detailed plan uh, moving forward. Um, but yeah, there's a um, business plan is it's pretty important. And honestly, one thing it can do is help you keep track of where you are in your progress. And it uh, kind of keeps yourself accountable because if you have some things on there and you aren't doing them uh, and you're not seeing the success or the, the movement forward that you want to see, you can always go back and consult your business plan. Uh, to kind of uh, write the ship. So it's definitely important to have. <laughs> so Thomas, you mentioned two concepts here, and I think it's important for uh, our audience to, okay. to, to really understand. One is the concept of a, of a traditional long form uh, detailed business plan. Mm -hmm. And the other is a concept of a, of a pitch deck. Mm -hmm. So, and I think you mentioned that uh, a pitch deck is probably something more appropriate in a, for an in an investor situation, could you provide some light on that subject? Uh, the pitch deck or the long form. Oh, pitch, let's start with the pitch deck and then the we'll pitch go. deck. Yeah. So uh, honestly, as a startup, I always tell them that you need several pitch decks uh, because you don't know uh, how much time you're really going to get with an investor or with a potential partner. So one thing that you need to have for your pitch deck is your elevator pitch, right? It's got to be memorized. You need to be able to tell someone something about your business and overall what you're trying to do in about 30 seconds or less. And if you can't do that, it, I mean, it's kind of difficult to really understand what you're really doing. You kind of need to refine it. So uh, that would be my first uh, note on like pitch decks is to really understand what you're doing. And then so uh, an actual pitch, pitch deck, right? Because then say you meet someone, say you meet Elon Musk in the elevator. And he's like, oh, how are you doing? How's it going? What do you do? I was like, oh, yeah, I'm doing a startup. Oh, yeah, well, what's it about? And then you give him the 30-second pitch. And if he likes it, then he'll say, oh, here's my card. Have them, uh, have my people get in contact with you and send us your uh, investor deck, right? And then so an investor pitch deck is usually, it depends on what it is, but it's between 8 and 13, 14 slides. Uh, but it's basically the kind of like highlight of your overall business. It's very high arching looking. 
you kind of put very big bullet points of like, what are you trying? What problem are you trying to solve? How are you going about buying, uh, trying to solve that, right? What kind of, uh, do the customers you know, do they know you had the problem? Um, who's on your management team? Like who, uh, who are the founders? Um, and uh, just kind of a lot of different things. If you have your market competitive prices, like who's out there? Do you have any competitors, future buyers, people that you might be interested? If you already are a pre-revenue, um, you can kind of talk about the uh, industry that you're getting in and how big it is. Uh, or if you're post revenue, you can talk about projections and a little bit, not much, but just a little bit of little things, little highlights here and there, just to really get the investors involved and in understanding what they uh, just really quickly because investors are busy, you know, and so uh, um, they private equity companies they see hundreds of pitch decks every day, and so you just kind of need to stand out. It's almost like your company's resume if you think about it, or future looking resume. Uh, Stephanie, you have anything to add on that? I, I agree. So what I see, and I do a lot of pitch competitions, is you need a 30-second pitch that concisely explains your company and your value proposition. You need a two-minute pitch if you get two minutes. And your slide deck will be 10 to 12 key slides. So who are you? What problem are you solving? What is your uh, market size? Not like the whole universe, but something that's realistic. Who are your competitors? And if you don't have direct competitors, who are the alternatives to your product or service? What's your mode? How do you keep competitors or alternatives out and direct your customers to your product or service? Um, how do you acquire customers? And then if you're pitching for funds, what are you going to do with the funds? What milestones? So pitch deck is important. Business plan would underlie the pitch deck. So if someone's interested in your company, the pitch deck is a first step in getting them engaged, but they'll want to do more due diligence and being able to go two levels deeper with a business plan and just say, we thought this through, or in some cases, if it's a novel service or technology, you know, we're, we're, in, we're making up the market here. You need to have thought that through. So you've got an answer, but uh, and I, I think to underline what both uh, Stephanie and Thomas were saying, your pitch deck is going to be a highly visible document, right? You're probably going to be a PowerPoint document with pictures, images, graphs, charts uh, that uh, can quickly, you know, as they say, one picture says a thousand words where your your picture shall, should, have, should communicate those critical elements of uh, the nature of your business, what your value proposition is, what the problems that are being solved, your sense and idea of your target market, as Stephanie indicated, and, uh, and, and how you face off against any competitive pressures out there. So in a fairly short period of time, you've got to let the investor know you understand the ballpark you're playing in and, uh, and how you're going to, and what type of team you're fielding uh, to handle the challenges in, in that particular game. And then with regards to a more formal and detailed plan that comes later uh, when you pass the mark with your investors and they want to learn about your business in greater detail that's when the more detailed business plan comes in and also for your lenders if you're involved in some cases many cases lenders will always want to see a more detailed business plan to make sure that uh, they understand your financial projections and your cash flow projections to make sure they you know uh where the money is going, how the money is going to be used, and uh, um, how you intend to grow based on that initial influx of capital from an investor or lender base. Um, uh, can we talk a bit about uh, legal structure, legal entity? Uh, I get this question many, many times from entrepreneurs. Uh, what sort of form of entity uh, should I have? How would you recommend that they approach this whole idea of business entity selection? Wow. Well, it depends. Um, I have entrepreneurs who start as a Delaware C corporation. They know they absolutely want to raise venture <clears throat> capital, so they go right to the gold standard. Other entrepreneurs, uh, especially in California, will start as a California limited liability company because it's easy to form, it's low cost. Uh, and easy to maintain. Maybe they need to be incubating their company for a year or more. 
And there's nothing wrong with having an LLC uh, because it's very simple. So it depends what your goals are. It depends on your time frame. But uh, as soon as you are prepared to start doing business, including to uh, bring co-founders into the mix, you should consider forming an entity because it's the nexus through which every interaction will flow and it will protect you from uh, lawsuits, including potentially from your uh, co-founders if you have a, a disagreement early on and someone should exit, so. Absolutely, I mean, another thing I would add on there, uh, uh, in terms of why you would even need to uh, get a business entity, one is to open a bank account, right? Like get an EIN number, uh, if, you, if you have to start, start having some revenues come in, you can apply for small uh, business loans, right? There's a lot of uh, benefits out there to have and own a business and run your business through an entity. A perfect example is during COVID, all the PPP loans, you can start um, being able to qualify for those and the SBA loans that were out there and available. And so um, it's, uh, it's really important to do so. And uh, if like in, in addition to protecting yourself from liability, which is one of the biggest reasons, but it also starts to show legitimacy for uh, you as an entrepreneur. If you were trying to start a business and you're interacting and engaging in business and all you have is yourself, you're just a sole proprietor and you're not registered or anything, people won't take you as seriously, right? Because it's not that difficult to set up an LLC, and especially in California, all it is is just a form you can go on the Secretary of State's website and you you get registered and then uh, and then you can start moving the ball. It's about it's about presenting uh, legitimacy to the public that you mean business. Um, and if you want to conduct business, then you should absolutely have uh, some form of entity. So, well, oh, sorry, Larry, go ahead. Uh, just a question. So can you describe the difference? Uh, between a uh, sole proprietorship and LLC and S Corp, a C Corp, uh, are, are there, are, is one better than the other? Is one more costly than the other? Right. Well, a sole proprietorship is no legal entity whatsoever. You can hang out a shingle and do business. You can get a tax ID uh, as a sole proprietor. Um, usually that income would be consolidated on your tax return. I'm not a tax expert, but Note that this uh, startup initiative is launched by tax lawyers as well as the business section. So sole proprietor, very simple. However, no liability protection. So if you do business with someone and you make money in the business, uh, your personal assets are at risk if someone sues you. So that is, as Thomas said, one of the strongest motivators for forming uh, an entity. And out of entities, there are two categories. One is a flow-through entity, and that would be LLCs and S-corporations. Those entities are not taxed at the entity level. The income is earned and it's attributed to the owners. A C-corporation is uh, taxed at the corporate level, and then if money is distributed out, it's taxed to the owners a second time. So you know, it raises the question, why would anybody ever go for a C corporation? There are many reasons, um, probably a bit uh, too many to go on the call, but uh, number one, um, any type of, of uh, owner could own a C corporation. An S corporation has to be owned by individuals or trusts. Uh, C corporations are highly standardized in terms of the governing documents, which makes it very uh, easy for investors to understand your legal structure. In a limited liability company, it's essentially a creature of contract. There's massive flexibility in terms of how you would draft the LLC agreement. And so from an investor point of view, if you're going to raise third-party capital, they have to do a lot more due diligence to get comfortable with you. So um, all of those S Corp, LLC, and C Corp will protect you from liability if you properly maintain them. It also goes to, in terms of which one you want to choose, uh, it can go down to complexity. If you just want to have a little shop uh, that you set up, uh, say you're a hairdresser, you just want to set up a little shop outside. I mean, it's just going to be you and you don't have any plans on growing. You just want to get a retail booth and do that, right? Like I would always pretty much almost always recommend just an LLC because it's simple, straightforward, easy to do, easy to maintain, 
Um, but it always comes down to complexity and kind of what your plans are for the future. And it just kind of depends on what business and in industry you're in. So it's very, uh, it's very uh, case specific in terms of which one would apply. Are there reporting requirements to the uh, either the state or to the IRS for either of these structures? You're going to file tax returns. Um, the taxes in a flow through will be reported on a K-1 or what's called a foreign K-1 to the individual owners. Uh, and a simple tax return would be filed. And then in a C corporation, the corporation actually will file a tax return. Uh, but all of these uh, will be reporting. And then in terms of state registration, in, if you're forming an entity in California, you're gonna pay the minimum franchise tax, which is $800. So you're always gonna be filing franchise taxes. And then if you are a corporation, you're gonna file an annual report. And if you're an LLC, you'll file every other year to tell the state you know, who your uh, managers are and who, you know, who, who are the people that are actually running the corporation or LLC. So I think you mentioned that one of the issues we should be concerned about is if we choose one of the pass-through entities, meaning uh, that uh, we will allow the entity to pay, uh, be taxed as opposed to ourselves individually based on the money, except if the entity pays us money. Um, but that would also allow us then to also pay ourselves a salary, right? And that would be deductible. So that might be Right. In an LLC, it's, uh, it's technically not a salary. Um, you get what's called a guaranteed payment. If you're one of the owners, if you're an employee, you can get a salary. So an LLC will expense uh, business items. In a corporation, uh, whether it's an S corp or a C, you'll be paying uh, yourself a salary as an owner and the IRS has certain minimums. You can't distribute out all the money in your S and avoid paying self-employment tax and so on, but you pay salaries, it's a business expense. So if, if, you, if you pay yourself a salary, uh, then the money you would get from the company, the dividend at the end of the year, then wouldn't be taxed at the at the uh, uh, income tax rate, right? It'd be lower, it'd be uh, it's tax a flow activity. through, it's a distribution. So it just, you know, the, the tax treatment will depend on uh, your tax treatment because it flows through your personal return. But in general, it wouldn't be subject to the self-employment and other employment type taxes, but it is taxable. It's um, generally, it's ordinary income, so. Okay, so if it's a non-flow through, if you set up an S corp or a C corp, you pay yourself a salary and then you receive a dividend, you'll be taxed two different ways, right? In an S corp, the money can flow out and that's not double tax. So you can pay yourself a salary as an owner of an S corp and it's just like any other W-2 income you would get. Um, you pay whatever your tax rate is and then the money that's distributed out is taxed as a corporate distribution. Um, in a C corp, they don't usually make distributions, particularly if you're creating a, an entity that's going to be seeking venture financing. They want the money to stay, those investors want the money to stay in the company. So salaries get paid and you pay your ordinary income tax on a salary, but only at the exit are you really seeing uh, monies flow out. Okay, great, thank you. That was very helpful. Yeah, and I think uh, the next, um... Uh, startup Institute meeting is actually very detailed going into uh, the choice of entity. So if you do have any specific questions, that'd be a great one to go to. Okay. Th th there, there are a couple uh, interesting questions um, that maybe you might want to uh, answer. If your client would like to form a Delaware, Delaware, Nevada corporation, what you as an attorney licensed in California can do for the client. Can you, prepare articles of incorporation bylaws, for example, and the, the writer is assuming that you're not licensed to practice law in Delaware, Delaware or Nevada. I mean, I form Delaware corporations all the time. People all over the country form Delaware corporations. It's the gold star of corporate law because it's the most established corporate law. It's the most litigated and therefore offers you the most certainty. So 
for people, again, seeking outside investment, you want to grow, you want to maybe secure uh, loan financing at some point when your business can support that, Delaware Corp is the gold standard. Um, you can form it. Anyone can form it. You don't have to be a lawyer to form an entity, actually. You can go online and, and form an entity. Um, most lawyers who work in the startup domain will become very familiar with Delaware in addition to their home state. Um, and many will look at other low tax states like Nevada or Texas um, as well. But you, but in California though, even if you, if you register, if you file it as a Nevada corporation, you still have to pay the California franchise fee, right? Yeah. 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 Go ahead, Thomas. I was just going to say, you'll have to register as a foreign entity and then pay the franchise fee if you're going to be so, doing business. So you can't escape Sacramento. <laughs> Don't try. They'll hunt you down. Um, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, and if you have an, if you're headquartered in California, you'll be registered here, uh, even if you're formed out of state in Delaware or Nevada. And if you have employees out of state in general, you'll have to register in every state where you have employees. So this has obviously become much more of an issue during COVID as we've accelerated the process of, of virtual companies and remote work, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. We have another question. Uh, can you comment on the use of, of a partnership structure like LLP uh, to offer legal services rather than a PC, professional corporation? I haven't formed, personally formed a lot of uh, professional corporations, so. Uh... I would have to look that up or defer to Stephanie. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Generally, I don't form them either. They're a very specific uh, creature of statute. They have spe specific licensing requirements. Like for example, lawyers, when we form PCs, you've got to carry certain types of insurance and make representations. So if you're forming a PC or an LLP, go to a lawyer that does a lot of that. Don't be their, um, you know, their learning. Uh, curve. You don't want to be the experiment. So find someone who does it all the time. And the same goes for nonprofit. If you're doing a nonprofit, most for-profit lawyers don't do nonprofit. Find a great nonprofit lawyer. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Uh, there is a question about DAOs. Is anyone familiar with DAO? It? Yeah. You mean Web3 DAO? They'd have to clarify that. It, it didn't give me any specific... Uh, so a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization uh it's becoming uh, incredibly prominent within the web three space uh that's a whole nother world um i, I know a decent amount stephanie if, if, if unless you do too i i do but you know it's a very specific topic that I yeah. think takes us sort of out of our intro it's a great topic to explore yeah. but yeah. honestly i think uh the business law section is going to be putting on a thing later about DAOs, so stay tuned. Okay, 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 great. Uh, and someone wants to know about uh, forming LLCs in Wyoming. Um, I don't know anything about the Wyoming law. Is, is there a, re a value to doing that? There certainly can be. Wyoming and New Mexico both offer the owner some ability to maintain anonymity. So in California and Delaware, you're going to report your directors and officers who they are. Now, the business address associated with those names can be the company's headquarters address, but people will know the names. Um, frequently, Wyoming is used as an asset protection jurisdiction because you can actually hire a nominee and keep your ownership and the management completely anonymous. And New Mexico offers some of that as well. So um, for asset protection reasons, yes, it's, uh, it could be useful, but probably not the best vehicle for attracting investors. Okay. Yeah. Well, great. That was that was all very uh, very good information. Um, let's see, we have uh, is there um, a, what is the best reason uh, for entrepreneurs to ha have an attorney? Does an entrepreneur <laughs> need to have their own private attorney? Uh, in terms of what. Uh... Uh, their own private attorney, meaning representing their business or also representing themselves. Because if well, you in, do you need one for the business and do you need one for your, your personal interests? I would say 
uh, it depends on level of sophistication. Um, I would 100% uh, advise if you are starting to really bring in revenue, at least find someone who's willing to help you along the way. Attorneys are really expensive, but at the same time, they can be absolutely instrumental in helping you along the way, not only in terms of protecting you legally, but advising you on how things to do, like things come up all the time and you have a lot of questions. And so one thing I find with a lot of my clients is, I mean, I act as like quasi in-house counsel for all of them, right? Because they, because like, attorneys are so specialized these days that most times you would have to be like, oh, well, you're going to have to talk to an employment attorney or uh, a securities attorney or a um, uh, like I, uh, intellectual property attorney, patent attorney. There's so many different things that you can go through tax planning attorneys. Uh, and so one good thing about as an entrepreneur for personal stance and if you were starting a business is to find an attorney that one you like to work with because they can be absolutely instrumental, like I said, but also they can help you manage the relationships with other attorneys that you are ultimately going to have to work with as you scale, right? So um, that's why one thing I kind of always suggest is just if you do find, if you want an attorney, one, I highly suggest you go find one to help. And two, find one that can help you and is willing to work with you and help manage your one expectations of what legal work you even need. Most people come to me like, Thomas, I have this great idea. Uh, I, what do I need to do? I need to do all this. I need to file this and do this and this and this and this and this and this and this. I'm like, slow down. What's your business plan? Let's go back to the business plan first, right? You don't need to do all these crazy things and spend all this money if you don't have an actual business plan, if you're not going to follow through with the project, right? And if you have an attorney that's just out there willing to be like, oh, uh, yeah, let's do it. Let's break it in. Here, here's a bill for $10,000, right? that's not beneficial to anyone other than the attorney if you're not actually going to proceed with the business, right? So I would suggest finding someone that you like and enjoy and even becoming kind of like personally acquainted with because like I said, a good attorney, a good startup attorney can help change the whole path and help guide you along this way if you are starting a business. Because if you're being an entrepreneur is not easy. It's not. And it, you wear a lot of different hats, you figure out a lot of different things. And one of the most instrumental people that, could, that you can't really do in terms of representation is legal work, right? You cannot, I mean, you can represent yourself, yes, but it's just, it is a, there's a huge web of things that you could run into and having a good attorney that's willing to work with you um, is instrumental in my opinion. So uh, you would rec you wouldn't advise doing legal zoom then i uh, i mean if you are uh just setting up a bracelet company and you just want to sell bracelets and you don't want to be sued uh because someone choked on your thing and you're worried about it, sure use legal zoom uh just because you're doing your own thing it'll cost you 75 bucks but at the same time if you have some inspirations to grow um beyond just a normal mom and pop shop just uh doing it for a hobby then then yeah i would say uh don't use legal zoom <laughs> okay. yeah i do a lot of legal zoom cleanup when people yeah. come to me uh, particularly when they get past the point of um really past the very basic point when they want to raise money from friends and family uh, even a small company if you're making money and doing business with the comp with the public if you have a corporation corporations have certain requirements that you do annual meetings of directors and, and officers if you haven't done those and you get sued um, there's a potential cause of action that that leaves you open to uh, so you want to make sure that whatever you're doing you're complying with the requirements for that type of entity um, absolutely you know, wow I, that, that, yeah. Stephanie, that and you've now, I think, put the the, the, the fright of uh, the business world in the minds of people. But I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. You you may agree to go into a corporate entity because it sounds like a great fun thing to do, but there are obligations that come along with that. Right. Having an attorney who can advise you as to what and remind you of what those obligations are. Yeah. Uh, like I would, I don't know if LegalZoom lets you know that uh, every two years. As an LLC, you've got to report to the state of California or you'll yeah. pay a nice little penalty. 
Right. Well, and a lot of people don't even understand that you will be paying a minimum of $800 a year in California. So if you consult an attorney before you uh, form your entity, they should be telling you, you know, what will your obligations be if you form an entity? Even if you go on legal Zoom, you'll have to do certain things and you want to know in advance what those are so you can plan for it, so you can budget for it. Um, you know, the worst thing is someone forms on legal zoom, they don't use the entity and then that $800 accrues every year and suddenly the state comes after you and you owe that <laughs> money. So <laughs> a surprise you know. bill from the state for an entity you haven't used. Well, that's right. And, yeah. and I agree with Thomas. I, you know, having that business handholding is, um, I like to become part of the teams with my entrepreneurs and give them the business guidance and give them the information so they can say, oh, you know what? We really do want to trademark our, our branding right now. Or, you know what? We're not going to spend the money to do that right now. And so that is a big role of having an attorney as part of your team is having them give you guidance and information so you can make informed decisions. I think it, it, the initial thought uh, amongst many uh, entrepreneurs was that the attorney just helps you file the legal paperwork. But now you're bringing up a much more sophisticated advisory role uh, that the attorneys are playing uh, to really help us keep what, keep our noses clean and stay out of trouble. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I just um, I couldn't advise more against it. a lot of people. You get a bad rap sometimes for being a lawyer, right? And you're like, oh, paper pushers, blah blah blah. But they can be your best friends, you know. And uh, it's cool to have one on a team because then they help you out and. And then you know how to allocate your money because legal expenses, sometimes you don't have the money to go out and try and get a patent that might not necessarily need one, or you might not even be at that stage or because it's, it's expensive because one of the most important things for startups is your cash flow, right? It's your cash flow and your capital is your lifeblood to be able to do things because everything in this world costs money. Right. Um, like to, you got to spend money to make money in this world, right? So you got to buy supplies, buy inventory, or um, you're paying for services if you're web-based or uh, you're paying for, say, uh, online um, uh, digital storage space, right? There's there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. And uh, it's, it's good to kind of um, have a, a consultation of when you want to spend that money and when you don't. Well, and to riff on that, I think there are two areas where I see entrepreneurs really come, come to me after the fact with painful problems. And one is uh, co-founders. You need to have a founder's agreement up front to set forth how do you split your equity? What happens if someone wants to leave? Are you vesting into your equity? There's a whole host of issues. Uh, make sure the company owns the intellectual property. So those are issues that are very challenging to fix. I'm sure Thomas has seen many of these too. And expensive. <laughs> really expensive. And they can end your company in a heartbeat. So that is uh, essential. Uh, so founders agreement, if there's more than one of you, and then the minute you're taking on money or entering into a contract, if you're taking money from an investor, you need to fully understand the terms of that money and what the expectation is from the investor because you don't want to be two years down the line and realize that you gave away a lot more of your company than you thought, or that the investor has the right to force you to do things you don't want to do, like maybe sell the company when you don't want to sell. So critical decision points when you definitely will find that the value is there. Even, even if that investor is your aunt Sadie. Absolutely. And especially because, you know, you need to, <laughs> You need to explain to her as well what what it means because most uh, early stage companies are not liquid, meaning she won't be able to get that ten or twenty five thousand dollars back if she should need that a year down the line, and so that is critical. Um, I've seen seen even a lot more sophisticated, um, for example, real estate investors who will suddenly invest in a tech company not realizing that a tech, an early stage tech company will not cash flow the way a shopping mall will and, and be very uh, unhappy about that. So avoid the conflict um, by getting some guidance up front so that both parties or all parties are, are informed and understand the deal. So I guess based on your comments, uh, starting a business with a partner is, is like getting married. You should get your get the divorce clause uh, agreed in advance. 
get that founders agreement, AKA prenup upfront. So, um, you know, because decision-making, are you 50, 50? Wow. What happens if you don't agree? Does that blow up your business? Um, how uh, do you have to earn your equity or do you get it all up front? And if you leave on day two, do you walk away with half the company? Um, is someone contributing a special asset or intellectual property? What happens there? Uh, how do you decide if one of you wants to take an investment and the other one doesn't? So mm. many issues to discuss. And, and it's usually a fun discussion to have up front. It's, again, a very mm. expensive and painful discussion to have later on. <laughs> You, you started to talk a bit about intellectual property. We have a question concerning the relationship between LLCs and trademarks, especially uh, uh, what happens if you've got an international situation where you have uh, trademarks registered in different countries. Uh, well, an LLC can own property just like a corporation can. So Number one, if you're creating any kind of intellectual property for a company, make sure the company owns it. Make sure you have a good uh, non-disclosure and assignment of inventions agreement so that uh, if, if any company contractor or employee is creating the IP, that you own it. Of course, if you're hiring a lawyer, then there's a, an understanding. But um, LLCs can own property abroad as well. So I'm not sure what the what the situation would be particularly other than making sure that the company itself owns the trademarks and not the individual founders. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's a very important thing to do. And that's something that all uh, investors are going to ask you um, if you've had uh, IP assignments from your founders and or all of your employees, right? Because what they ultimately don't want, one of the biggest thorns in an investor's side is litigation, right? So if there is a disgruntled employee uh, that has worked significantly on, say, uh, back end of your code for one of your applications that you're uh, planning on selling as a SaaS platform, right? And you don't have an IP assignment, uh, it could be very expensive down the line, uh, especially if you had some conversations about uh, ownership or whatever pay or maybe future equity in the company, right? Like uh, that could lead one to believe that that they the employee was owning some of the, their rights, right? And so it can be very, very expensive. And that's something that uh, investors really look towards. Mm -hmm. I've had uh, departing employees and founders claim they own everything from a mailroom process that was essential to a shipping company to um, software code. Uh, and I mean, you name it. And then you're just in a world of hurt. So get the document up front. And the investors, if you get investors, they'll check. They'll check everyone. They'll cross check your employee list and your contractor list, and they'll make sure you have them. Yeah, they'll do it. They'll go through your data room, and if it's there, <laughs> not good. So how how easy? Let's say you you don't have a wealth of contacts. Um, how easy is it to find an attorney? I mean, should they contact the the bar association? Definitely. Yeah. Uh, honestly, if you don't have a lot of contacts, and if you're starting a company, get used to making a lot of contacts. <laughs> um, networking is everything. If you're going to be a CEO and if you're going to start a business, you have to talk to people. You have to start making relationships, right? So um, it's always good to reach out to the bar association. Absolutely. Um, so, and they could help maybe put you in front with someone that might fit well, but ultimately this goes back to what I said before um, about picking your attorney, right? Your attorney. And like Stephanie says, she likes being part of the team, right? Because, being part of the team helps you work better. And if you're going to be picking a team and putting one together, you need to find someone who you like to work with, not just Joe, you know what I mean? Like, uh, like make, get used to making connections because uh, as a CEO, one of your main jobs is to go out there and put the team together, manage the team, manage the relationships on the team, make deals with people. Right. So um, if you don't know a lot of people, if, um, Maybe it's just it's just, it's time to start 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 networking a little bit, uh, going to functions, going to different things, and just start asking people. And if there's someone that's oh I'm a startup attorney or oh I do I'm an attorney I do corporate financing whatever it is, uh, maybe start getting to know that person. You know uh, that's just my philosophy about it. When uh, a lot of CEOs are like oh I'm trying to get sales, I'm like go talk to people, man, go talk to them. <laughs> 
Okay, great, great. Um, when gonna there is a uh, an IP event uh, for entrepreneurs coming up on uh, June twentieth. So keep your eyes peeled. Uh, there will be a uh, startup event for uh, the intellectual property area put on by the Beverly Hills Bar Association on June 20th. So we'll be sending out announcements on that coming up. Um, let's switch gears now and talk about the, the timing and need for an accountant. Who wants to handle that, Thomas? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, it, as soon as you start bringing money in for real, for real, you need to have some form of account, whether or not it's QuickBooks, whether or not it's some other software out there, but you need to keep track of every sale you make, right? Uh, because that's income. And you need to keep track of every expense you make because that's writing off against your income, right? <laughs> and so uh, there's a lot that needs to go into it. This is also a level of sophistication, um, but as soon as you start bringing in money, you need to be talking to an accountant, period. And there are bookkeeping services that are wonderful that will start with you even on a monthly retainer to help you set up a QuickBooks or some other simple software to track revenue and expenses so that you can uh, know what you have and so that your accounts are in order at the end of the year when taxes are due. Yeah, that's one thing I would never tell anyone to do. Talk to people who know how to keep account of your books. <laughs> that's very important, incredibly important. Yeah, great initial expense. If you can budget a little for it, at least start having a conversation so you know what's, uh, what's required and then get it as soon as you can. It'll take a lot of stress off you and let you focus on developing the business as opposed to tracking um, daily expenses. Yeah. yeah. I think you're absolutely right. Having a system uh, that's somewhat automated so that uh, you can easily have your data entered and, uh, and reports can be spit out so that you can monitor the performance of your business, the inflows and outflows of, of cash, especially, uh, so you can determine how well or how poorly you're doing in enough time to be able to take corrective action if necessary. Mm -hmm. Having everything on, uh, on Excel spreadsheets is fine, but it, it doesn't give you timely results. Sure. So. Uh, so I think having a bookkeeper and an account bookkeeper for keeping track of the numbers on a day to day basis, but an accountant help, helping you to to do the appropriate planning yeah. uh, on a long term basis is I think what you're talking about. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we talked a lot about a, a little bit about founders and people who start businesses, whether they start them alone or with partners, especially in a situation where they're starting in their business with one or more people, uh, we spoke about agreements. Let's talk about that whole process of, of, uh, of how you wanna organize yourself as, as a founder. Uh, what, what are the types of agreements that should there be between founders? Uh, who should be allowed to join uh, a, a group? Should there be conditions for being one of the founding members? How, would, how do you advise your clients? getting started well, that's a lot <laughs> that's a lot to unpack I, yeah. I agree a lot of teams will start organically especially young founders I have a lot of teams coming out of universities like UCLA and USC and they meet in the dorm room or they meet in business school class and they get an idea or they work on a project and you know in general and, and I've been through several iterations of founding companies with people as well. Um, you want your team to be with people who are compatible, good chemistry, but everyone needs to bring something to the table uh, in terms of the company and launching it and, and building it. Yeah, I would have to echo exactly what Stephanie just said. Um, it, it depends in terms of who's going to be on the team and who's a founder. If you have an idea uh, and you say you have a hundred thousand dollars and you don't know, say it's a software company, right. That you want to start, but you're not a coder, right. It, it goes back to putting that team together, going out and networking. You got to find some type of developer. Right. Um, and so one thing that Stephanie said that hit the nail on the head was uh, 
uh, make sure everyone has a role, a role, plays a very, very specific role that they can contribute to launching the company, because that is where most disputes with it founders occurs almost always is uh, Kevin is out there developing all the software, doing all the work. Uh, Ryan is out there being the CEO, grinding, um, doing uh, meeting a lot of people, getting a community, getting sales, hyping up the project. And then you've got Aaron, who is uh, a, a web designer, and she's dominating and just making all this cool stuff. And then out there, you've got um, let's see, uh, Mark, and he's just not doing anything. He's like, who's supposed to be the marketer guy, kind of not really doing much, but he owns 20% of the company and he's not contributing. And then that's where everything starts to become bad, right? So I would look for hard skills that can contribute to you building your idea of your product and have definable roles and create accountability. And if you can figure out, this is where this business plan comes in too that we were talking about earlier. If you have an idea, you gotta map it all out and when you're putting the team together to make it work, you have to think about how this person is actually going to contribute because they're not gonna be paid cash a lot of times. They're gonna have equity. And with equity, you have power in what happens to the future of the company. You have voting rights and you could be carried very easily. And it's also, it's hard to get rid of a founder too as soon as you give them equity. So it's oh, yeah. very important. <laughs> That's part of having a founder's agreement. I had a team come to me a few weeks ago. They hadn't formed an entity yet and they already had to get rid of one of the founders. So uh, they didn't have an assignment of IP agreement. And so we had to talk about what IP that person had and then you know didn't want to spook them. So ended up giving them back some of the expenses they had incurred and, and having a letter where they, you know, it's very sort of soft, but not tight in the way that you would ideally want things to be, mm -hmm. but it was the best we could do. But having roles, having equity best, meaning everybody earns it over time and having, so, and having accountability. So if you're not filling your role, you need to, you know, there needs to be a mechanism for exiting founders that aren't filling their role and repurchasing their equity. Well, so you're bringing up a really important point here because generally startups have zero cash, right? And, and, and so what they use is this funny money called equity to compensate people, even if they're not founders. You know, you come on and you act as my uh, head of marketing and, and we'll give you shares. Well, that's good when you get the work, but if it's not working out, then it, what, uh, how do you deal? Do you recommend doing that in this situation? How do you recommend they handle this? That kind of bootstrap is the only way for a lot of people. So there are different ways you can give <laughs> equity. Um, one is you can give something called restricted stock, which is actual ownership. The other one is you can give options, which the person has to write the check to exercise. Um, but in either case, there has to be, uh, if someone isn't performing, there has to be a way to exit them and repurchase their equity for a nominal amount of money. So the equity that they haven't earned yet, the unvested equity is expired and forfeited, but the equity, you know, if, it's, if they're vesting into equity over time, um, they might've earned some. So you've got to have a way to get that back if they're not performing. Um, the other thing is, don't give a vesting up front. People should be staying mm -hmm. around for what's called a cliff period, either, either six yeah. months or a year before they get anything. They can get the agreement up front that says, hey, if you're here six months later contributing or a year later, you're gonna get 25% of your equity. But um, don't just start giving it, when you start giving it on day one, that's where you get the problems. I, I mean, as I said earlier, I had someone give 10% in exchange for business development services in a company. And 10 years later, we're now um, in a litigation because that person never performed, but they're making all kinds of demands and uh, there was no agreement in place to, to exit them. So wow. yeah, no kidding. Well, that's, wow. very that's very valuable information. I, I think it, of all the things we talked about today, that's the one thing that can really come and bite you in the rear at, at a time when you could least afford to have it happen. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know what vesting or a cliff is, just real quick, 
uh, a cliff is when <laughs> say you get 20% of uh, equity to a company, to a founder, you enter a founder's group and one person gets 20%. Uh, they won't get anything at all until a cliff period occurs, like Stephanie was saying. So between six months and a year, uh, just depending on what you guys are doing. And then at the, the cliff period, that's when you start getting stock. And then you have a vesting period, which is after that. It's where, say, every couple year or every year or even every quarter, whatever it is, a certain amount of, of additional equity that you had starts vesting, right? So a lot of times it's, you get 20% stock of the one year cliff over a four year vesting schedule, right? So at the end of the fourth year, everything will invest it and you'll have all 20%. And it's a way to just recoup losses and put a t temporal time frame on the equity that they're actually gonna earn so that they do end up leaving. It's, it's easy to recoup that 10%. Say if they left after the first year, you get 15% of that back immediately if, if you wrote the agreement correctly. And the underlying idea is in a in a early stage business when you're growing it it's really important to keep the equity in the hands of those people who are actively engaged in creating value mm -hmm. if you're not actively creating value you're taking upside and you're not contributing to it so that's and that's what investors want to see as well so um critical critical piece is is vesting we have a question in, uh, on evaluating equity versus debt opportunities, but I don't understand the question. So if the person who wrote that question can uh, really clarify that, uh, I, I'll, I'll certainly pose it to our panel. Yeah, I will say also the books for this course are excellent. So I know that um, Be Smarter Than Your Lawyer, the um, Brad Feld and uh, Jacobson book is, is in part two, but it's a great way to start learning about some of these basic, basic issues um, of equity investing. Um, of course, the, the ones for part one are also fantastic. We've got startup law and fundraising for entrepreneurs. There's chapters on vesting and founder agreements and same with acceleration. Um, and I'm also reading a book right now called Super Founders which goes very much in depth about the types of founders that people bring on and what drives success in uh, super successful companies. So educate yourself before you bring on a co-founder. Absolutely. Couldn't say it better, Stephanie. Good job. Great. Um, we mentioned something about uh, uh, vesting. Um, and, and the use of vesting uh, should, how, how do you tie that into uh, your uh, uh, agreements and how often is it done? I mean, I do it every time. I, I, if people don't want to vest, I always explain the downside of not having mm -hmm. founders earn their equity. Um, so it's baked into the founders agreements, um, their equity grant agreements, um, you know, just depending on the form of equity grant that they choose, it's it's baked in. If you have an LLC, uh, there could, it could be part of the operating agreement or it could be a separate agreement. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's easier to make it a separate agreement and just cross-reference it. But and it, used, oh, and it can be used later too in something like an equity incentive plan, right? Uh, right. So you can have a vesting schedule in that too. So say if you're four years in and uh, you didn't do investing, but your founders, everything's good. Every, everyone's happy. Everything went well. You lucked out, no hardship, right? But four years later, you're starting to really bring on some important people and you want to say, bring on a, a, a national sales representative. So you have um, uh, Carrie come on and give her a, uh, and you can have an equity incentive plan drafted up and then have it in an employment agreement, but also in the equity incentive plan itself that covers the vesting schedule there. Yeah, usually founders will be treated uh, a little bit more favorably and differently, or your key executives as you're onboarding them are going to get maybe equity in a structure that's slightly more tax beneficial and favorable. Um, but for uh, growing your workforce, your software development team, your sales force, or whoever they are, adopting an equity incentive plan is, is a really important step. And then you're kind of set up just automatically, you know, issue agreements with the equity. 
So Stephanie, you mentioned a, a, a book on the list. Uh, one of the participants is interested in knowing where they can find the book list. Um, it should be at the end of the syllabus. Um, I've got the part one syllabus um, and those part one books are on the syllabus. Um, there should be one for part two as well, but um, circle back to uh, the organizer and maybe we can even get those posted up on the website so that everybody, okay. everyone can see them. Okay. Um, now, we've been spending a lot of time talking about uh, equity investments in, in business, and, and, and uh, it was pointed out to us that we haven't spent much time on, on debt. And so it, the, the, the debt world is uh, uh, still very active. Uh, there are uh, financial institutions that are willing to lend to startups under certain conditions, because loans always have to be paid back, right? Um, that the the objective of someone lending to you lending you money, even if it's your your great uncle Dave, he's lending you money. He has an expectation of being paid back. Maybe not right away, but he has that expectation. A bank or a non bank financial institution, if they lend you money, they will have an expectation to be paid back. So uh, a financial institution is going to look for either some form of collateral or going to look for uh, a, a history of uh, you having paid back other loans before in, in the past, or that you have a spouse or a member of your family that's making significant cash flow uh, that's still that's free and available to cover any uh, uh, debt service uh, associated with the obligation. So uh, debt funding is available, uh, but it generally comes with, with strings. And, uh, and the strings are, you got to prove to me that you can pay it back. Uh, Stephanie, Thomas, anything to add to that? So many flavors of, of debt. Um, for an early stage company, you're most likely to use a convertible note. A traditional bank is not going to lend for the reasons that Larry mentioned and Thomas is nodding. You don't have assets that uh, they can lend on and that they could monetize if you <laughs> didn't pay back. And and you probably don't have cash flow. So those are the two basic things that lenders will look at. Sometimes uh, people will take out a small business administration loan and secure that with your home. So there are many, many options for using debt. Um, you know, if you don't have to mix your personal assets into the business, um, that's the, a better world than if you do have to put your house or other personal assets at risk. But um, as you scale, there are many more options available. I had a client that just did a $7 million venture debt financing, and they just qualified for that because they have uh, revenue and they have positive cash flow. They have positive pre-tax income. But for the first four years, they didn't qualify for any kind of uh, debt other than um, investor convertible debt. So, you know, as you go up the financing <laughs> chain, there'll be more options for you. I, sh I should mention there is uh, that there are other options, and you, many of you are aware of the term crowdfunding. Crowdfunding has become quite popular. Uh, there is debt crowdfunding, there is equity crowdfunding, and there is out and out uh, there's rewards crowdfunding and gift crowdfunding. And there are lots of platforms uh, that offer uh, various approaches to getting money from the crowd. And uh, so it's the 21st century way of getting money, getting cash. Everything requires, though, whether you're getting money from your Aunt Sally or you're getting money from the crowd or from a financial institution or a group of investors, you need a plan, you need a pitch deck, you need a story. And uh, so if there's one important message for all of you. It is you've got to develop that story. You've got to be able to communicate uh, the value that you are bringing to the table, why someone should open their pocketbooks to you. Absolutely. That's, okay. that's definitely true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see, we've got another question here for clients looking to make a small investment that is immaterial to the rest of their portfolio. What do we ask for besides a business plan with cash flow projections and balance sheet info without going overboard on due diligence? 
Wait, can you repeat the, the question? Exactly? So if you were, so if, so as, as a, a representative of this person who uh -huh. uh, says they're interested in making a small investment that is immaterial to the rest of their personal portfolio, what should they ask the uh, company that they're interested in investing in for besides a business plan and cash flow projections in a balance sheet? What else should they ask for? Make sure it's a real company. Oh, go ahead, Thomas. I, I had a lot of people go for cannabis investments three and four years ago, and some of them literally invested in a different company than the company that held the warehouse or the refinery or the fields or the growth. So number one, make sure there's a, a legal entity that you are investing in. Get the uh, certificate of incorporation. And that's a very reasonable ask because the company should have that uh, available. Understand if you're making an equity investment, what are the total authorized shares in the company and how many are you buying so that you know what percentage of the company you're getting for your investment, or if you're getting debt and you're going to maybe convert it to equity, understand that. But basic due diligence, you, you should, you know, if you don't ask for any, then you should maybe expect to not necessarily see the money again. So yeah, I was I was gonna say uh, everything you said was gold. Uh, I was just gonna say it depends on what immaterial means too. You know, I mean, uh, because if you're just doing it because he or she is your friend and you want to help them out, then I mean, it's immaterial, right? Whatever, here you go. But if it's uh, immaterial in a sense that you hope to have it back and you want to take part in this um business if you want to be a shareholder and kind of um kind of have some more influence over what happens and kind of be an advisor then <laughs> i would advise that you uh, no due diligence no there's not enough due diligence that you can do right so uh, it just depends because honestly if if you don't if as a as a company if someone was hesitant to allow due diligence from an investor, I would I would be like I, I want you to ask every question you possibly can. I want because it's like hey if you if this is an immaterial investment for you, you can ask as much as you can because um, those people might want to learn the information from you and grow. You know, so uh, uh, this I would say it depends significantly, but I I'm a big believer in due diligence and understanding Same. what you're getting into. Yeah. So what's that uh, famous expression, buyer beware? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. exactly. And a good company that's well organized. Um, today, it's easy to have a digital data room with all your basic uh, entity documents in one place, signed, easily accessible. You can give access to that data room. And, exactly. Yeah. And if you don't have, uh, just to piggyback off that, if if the company that you are investing into doesn't have a data room or doesn't know what it is, I mean, that's a red flag right there, right? And so, because today you can have a data room and send one link and they you can see everything or you can send two links and you can see just folders that are important to you, right? So it is not that difficult to shed, to be able to conduct due diligence anymore if uh, as long as they're organized and depending on the, the stage and structure uh, and like, how long the business has been around. One of our questioners asks, are you digging into family relations of founding members when they come to you to get advice about forming a legal entity? How much diligence do you do about them? Uh, can you ask that again? I'm not sure. I so, so they want to know, are you doing diligence on the founding members when they come to you about forming a legal entity for a business? Uh, do you research them before you just automatically create a legal entity? Me, myself? As an attorney, they're yeah, coming oh, to I, I don't work with people I don't know. <clears throat> you know what I mean? I don't work with people I don't know. Uh, that's why I keep harping, oh, hey, uh, go meet people. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, you don't know an attorney? Go, go meet one, go make friends with one, right? Like I don't work with people who I don't actually know pretty well or I engage in a relationship with them and then I only do it on a small basis and then you let that evolve. Right. Um, like I'm not just going to go help people immediately if, uh, if that's what they want. Like, so I, yeah, I do my own due diligence in terms of who I work with. Absolutely. Stephanie, what about you? 
Yeah, I do a betting call. I mean, at this point, I've had my firm for 18 years and most of my business comes through referrals. So um, depending on my comfort level with that, um, you know, I might uh, just Google. I'll, I always have a pre-call just to see what the goals are and then who they are, where they're coming from. And, you know, if there's a red flag, I won't do it. But forming an entity itself is a pretty low level. Um, when you get to the point of starting to engage in commercial contracts or taking an investment, the due diligence then and who is that founder becomes much more important and significant, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great. Um, we're now getting into... Uh, uh, questions about tax and uh, uh, one big question about tax is uh, what considerations are with it from a perspective of taxes should we be concerned about in the early stages? I think you mentioned the, uh, the franchise tax in the state of California. That's something that's significant that everybody should be aware of. Are there any other tax related uh, questions or issues that early stage uh, entrepreneurs should be concerned about? I mean, my engagement agreement expressly disclaims tax advice. So I will tell you the difference between a flow through entity like an LLC or an S Corp and a C Corp that's taxed twice. Uh, we can talk a little bit about, you know, stock options. But beyond that, if there is a tax issue, I, I bring in a tax counsel because tax is um, rapidly evolving and complex. So I, I couldn't agree more. There are uh, in terms of just what questions you might want to ask an attorney. Uh, I would say uh, just something that come off the top of the head, issuing shares, uh, 83B uh, elections um, uh, in terms of that, because that's going to have a big uh, impact on how that goes. Uh, but yeah, just ask them, ask a tax attorney. Like I, I don't, I, whenever one of my, I say, you should talk to an accountant and talk to a tax attorney. I, it, it gets really fast, really quick. And so uh, but some that come off the head, like I said, is 83B elections and also the franchise tax and then also sales, income, use, all of those things, right? Like expenses, those are all tax considerations. Anytime you are receiving money or spending money, track it, record it, because those all have tax implications, right? Um, uh, but yeah, uh, in terms of just the, but there's there's a lot, there's a lot. So, uh, but remember that one, because that's one an important decision to make early on is the 83. Good. Yeah, a good CPA should be able to advise you uh, on a lot of those things. So you don't necessarily need tax counsel, but a good CPA will be able to help. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, just to remind everyone that in the chat, you will find uh, information on the various texts uh, that we refer to and then some other information from the from the organizers that you should be aware of. So check out the chat for important uh, side information. Um, let's go on to this whole issue of NDAs, how to protect intellectual property. How important are NDAs? And do you need an NDA for anyone that you're talking to? Are there any people you can trust without an NDA? <laughs> this is a tricky question. It's, there's no like if and or buts. Like yeah, NDAs are important, it depends on what you're talking about. Uh, but at the same time, there are a lot of private equity firms who refuse to sign MDAs and won't engage with you if you try and make them sign one. So, um, cause they see a lot of this stuff every single day and they usually invest in people, not ideas first. The first it's people, next is ideas. And then is it the right team to work in place? And if those people, and if the people you're engaging with, um, the, the private equity firms, they're gonna wanna Hump, hop on it right away right like they're gonna they'll know and so they're not gonna they're not in the business of stealing ideas and doing stuff most people aren't uh because you can always backtrack it and you have the conversation so well you refuse and that's manipulation so i'm suing you anyway right so it's like there's a lot of ways to go about it um it, it it's kind of an ad hoc thing uh i suggest ndas when there's very 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 important very actual proprietary information. If you're just talking about an idea that has not been conceptualized or has no work pen to paper, you don't need, you don't necessarily need one if you're talking to people just because you haven't done anything yet, right? So you have to talk to people eventually. And if, 
you're going around and you haven't done anything and you're making people sign NDAs just to engage with you, it's going to turn them off. Right. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's like an ad, it, it's a tough, it's, it's interesting, but they they do have their place and they do have uh, good uses, but it's, it's, it's hard to tell when or not one would be effective. I agree. Your attorneys, we're bound by a duty of confidentiality. Most uh, if CPAs have their CPA duties. Um, employees, you know, again, NDAs and assignments are important, um, but also with, with the right carve outs, if something's public, then it has to be carved out of the NDA because no one's going to agree to keep something quiet and confidential if it's known to everybody else in the world. Um, as, as Thomas said, private equity funds don't sign them, venture capitalists don't sign them. Um, so if you were at the point of raising money and you're having someone come and visit your data room and you're talking about your company, figure out which parts of the business concept or product you can discuss and disclose without risking um, disclosing something that's proprietary that could potentially undercut your, um, your uh, proprietary technology. So you can uh, disclose it in levels, you know, have a public pitch that you can say, this is what we do. And then the how we do it and the secret sauce is something, you know, maybe uh, that you disclose much later down the line if you're in a due diligence process with an investor. Okay. Um, just being mindful of the time and uh, we've got several questions in the box, but uh, a couple issues I think we really need to handle uh, before we open up for general questions. One is this whole area of, uh, of contractors, that is 1099s versus employees. And I know that that's a highly specialized uh, issue. There have been some very famous court cases here in the state of California about that. But can you at least touch on that for us? It's a minefield. Get an employment lawyer. <laughs> I, uh, I couldn't echo that more. I have a couple clients dealing with these issues right now. Uh, where I told them, I was like, I, I don't know, you got to hire an employment attorney. And now, and they didn't. And now they don't know what's going on now. You know what I mean? So it's like, I heard, uh, yeah, follow the advice. I think one of the later sessions will talk about employment law and how uh, a new business should be thinking about that. But in general, in California, most people are characterized as employees. It's harder and harder to characterize someone as a contractor. So Tread carefully. Plaintiffs' lawyers love to um, file. Yes. So, um, and you know, if you're hiring a corporate lawyer, which Thomas and I both are, and we both act as sort of quarterbacks for our clients, we know employment lawyers who can deal at different levels of companies, so they can give you even a basic letter to onboard your people. You know, yeah. just a basic handbook. I mean, things that you will want to invest in. Don't, if you can avoid it, don't get it off the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and a lot of these things, there's like uh, statutory, I, I guess, is things that I'm learning. There, statutory uh, penalties that are mandated. So, uh, like you said, a lot of plaintiffs' attorneys love to just rack it because they have a temporal component to it. And the longer you do it, the more it works, and the more money they're entitled to, and it's it racks up really fast, really quick. And honestly, what I've learned, and some people have told me, is that the, the judges. Uh, they don't have any tolerance for it. It's uh, it's pretty quick. So it's either you kind of got to settle it out and work at it out, or it's pretty it's, it's tough. It's pretty tough. <laughs> so hire a employment attorney. <laughs> okay. So let's see. I've got a a couple questions here. Uh, by family relations of founding members. I mean, their family members like spouse or children. California is a community property state, so a founder can inadvertently use money or property he or she cannot use without permission of the other spouse. Do you uh, do you do any due diligence associated with such issues? Uh, I, I, that's a long-winded question. I'm not exactly sure what. Right. Yeah, it's, so I'm, I would say 
Yeah. So for certain types of agreements, like when you're giving, so for all the founders agreements I do, there's something called a spousal consent attached, whereby the spouse has to sign and acknowledge they got a copy of the agreement that says the company has the right to buy the equity back and, and certain other conditions. Yeah. Um, and you would see that in a founder's agreement for a corporation or baked into a limited liability company operating agreement. So yes, it's important because especially when you're in a smaller, closely held uh, business setting, you know, if a spouse passes away or they leave, uh, or there's a, a dissolution of the marriage, you, um, you don't want a spouse who's never been involved with the business to suddenly be weighing in on business decisions. It's, it's disruptive. Um, and I've had spouses of deceased uh, business partners come back and sue because they didn't like, uh, they didn't like the deal that their spouse made. So very, very important to have it documented and have a spousal consent. Um, it might be challenged anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so we are now in the final um, nine minutes. Uh, I think uh, rather than go to the detailed program, I want to open it up for, for questions before to make sure that there are no other questions that we have in the audience. Uh, someone had a question about uh, finding a good uh, accountant uh, uh, familiar with both California and New York law. Um, any suggestions there? might not be the same person. Um, you know, it depends how much money you have to spend, but the bigger accounting firms that are national tend to cost more and they will cover multi oh, come, Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you're just starting, you might end up with, with two. I mean, for federal uh, tax issues, they might be familiar, but state and local level issues can vary pretty dramatically. Yeah, yeah the, the larger firms, uh, you know, Deloitte's and uh, of the world, uh, they'll, they'll have specialists that cover both coasts and even some of the medium-sized firms too. Uh, and we've got several here in, uh, that are based here in Los Angeles. And I would bet your friendly uh, Beverly Hills Bar Association attorney will be happy to refer some of their accountant contacts. Absolutely. Other questions here coming in, let's see. Given the health climate around the world right now due to the coronavirus, as well as the conflict in Ukraine, what has your assessment been on the stability of new ventures or investments? What are your views about the outlook of things or what to factor in? Okay. Uh... I can, uh, well, it depends on where you were living. Um, uh, California was very shut down. I'm not gonna lie, I lost a lot of clients to different states. Uh, they moved out of California because they were shut down. They moved to places like Texas or Florida. Uh, now that California is opening up again, uh, I haven't necessarily seen a return of that business. I mean, I'm not gonna get too political and things, but it, it, um, having the economy shut down definitely hurt in terms of certain aspects right different industries were impacted differently a lot of uh investment was shifted to web-based most everything was shifted to web-based obviously uh and then that's coming back in the folds you can kind of see there's a there's a lot happening in the world there's a lot of issues like china has been shut down so i mean there's a lot of supply chain there's a lot of manufacturing goods that come out of china and so that has impacted a lot of different things there's Inflation's going through the roof like crazy right now. So like the Federal Reserve is actually continuing to raise interest rates at a really steady pace. Um, so raising interest rates makes money more expensive to borrow and it creates a crunch on the actual available liquidity in uh, the overall system, right? Uh, and so that kind of ties up uh investment sometimes uh but it's something that's necessary markets are cyclical um my view is always kind of positive at the end of the day because i think that we're going to get out of this uh, i think things are um going to have a bright future i mean 
Um, I can definitely see the market's going to be turbulent and investment being a little turbulent uh, going forward and then a little near future, but we'll come out of it at the end of the day. Uh, things will be good times and we'll be past it, right? And as a as an official baby boomer, um, things have been worse and uh, they have been better. So just be patient. Mm -hmm. It'll That's right. Change. Southern California, I mean, California has a robust economy. Southern California particularly has a very robust creator economy. It's more of a service economy than Northern California. And so the service economy was hurt during COVID um, when we couldn't have live events and things. I mean, I've been asked for council for a very large event for over a decade and that shut down. It was a big bite. Uh, it's it's restarted, um, but online businesses thrived and uh, yeah. created a lot. So, in general, right now, because the public markets have repriced, the private markets have also repriced. They tend to trail maybe four to six quarters. So, if you're looking for investment, you know your valuation might be lower. But there's still a lot of money. If you have a value proposition and you're serving a market and you can demonstrate that you will be a candidate for investment absolutely Con consumers are still buying they may yep. be griping about the prices but they're buying yep, yep and the state of california announced today i think that we have a 75 billion dollar surplus so uh all's not bad yes we're doing well <laughs> we're gonna give it right. all right just takes time sometimes yeah here's a question uh, regarding hiring tech outsourced overseas how can agreements and ip protection be enforced with overseas staff thoughts on dealing with outsourced overseas staff in tech in a tech setting challenging you might have to engage overseas counsel and find out what the limitations are on uh you know IP protection. I mean, of course, you can have them sign agreements, but it's it can be challenging to enforce. So that's kind of a structural question about how are you going to structure your workforce and what uh, functions you're going to have them do and how you're going to rely on them, you know, and it's a, it's a strategic question as much as a legal question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I completely agree with that. It's, it's, it's challenging just because, I mean, I, I spent six months in Beijing when I was in law school doing a m a work for a very large firm over there. And so uh, uh, they do not take trademarks very seriously. They just don't. And uh, they are not afraid to kind of take some of your IP sometimes. And so yeah. uh, I'm not like knocking them specifically, but it's just other countries in general. It's just the risk yeah. of doing business in jurisdictions that aren't necessarily the same as ours and, and and believe in the same protections that we do, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's important to think about. One thing that you can do, if you, if you have specific talent, you can try and apply for an O-1 visa and do immigration uh, and then have them come to the States. It just depends. But if you're going and paying less money because you're trying to get, you're, you're trying to save money on development by outsourcing it to a different country, I mean, you're just going to have to run those risks uh, sometimes. But uh yeah, it's gonna, it's hard. It's a, it's a strategic move, like Stephanie said. Well, panelists, we have uh, one minute left, and I'd like to give you both an opportunity to uh, make some closing remarks. As, as attorneys, you're probably used to doing this. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go ahead, Stephanie, or? <laughs> Absolutely. Not a trial attorney, but I will say I have a true passion for working with entrepreneurs. I am, never cease to be amazed by the new product services um, and business models that people come up with. I just love it. So um, it can be a bumpy going to be an entrepreneur, but if you have a passion for it, go for it. Um, go for it. Do the networking that Thomas said and get as many smart brains around the table as you can get to help you uh, grow and thrive. I can echo all those sentiments. Uh, I love, I've done litigation in the past, uh, still do some here and there, uh, but mainly do startup financing, startup um, like oh, advisory just now. Uh, but I love working with people. I, I'm very driven, motivated person. I really like working with people who want to build something. 
Um, one of the reasons why I got had to get out of litigation is litigation is about breaking things down. Transactional is about building things up. And uh, I really love building and I love being around people. Um, and uh, I come from a background of kind of entrepreneurs and people, like Stephanie said, if you, you have an idea and you have something that's cool, go for it. <laughs> go for it. The world needs you. You know what I mean? The world, the world needs you. Look at what's going on, right? We need people like you to go save the world and make a cool idea and grow something great. So, uh, um, so yeah, thanks for everyone for coming. Uh, if you have my contact information, I'm sure the Beverly Hills Bar Association will give it out. I love this stuff. I can talk about it any day, all day. Um, don't hesitate to reach out um, if you ever want to just chat about anything. I like this, these kinds of things. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists. Uh, I know that the Beverly Hills Bar Association is excited about putting this on. Please uh, attend the future sessions of, uh, of uh, our entrepreneurs program. Uh, please note that uh, I am uh, a part of an organization at El Camino College called the Small Business Development Center Network. We're funded by the federal government, the SBA. And, uh, at, and, and so we provide advisory services uh, at no charge. Uh, all paid for by the government. So uh, uh, please contact the Small Business Development Center at El Camino College or at many of the other uh, community colleges uh, around Southern California, and uh, you can get the assistance uh, that you might need. So with this, we'd like to sign off and say good night, stay safe out there, and uh, see you at our next uh, scheduled session. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.